Good morning. My name is Aditya Patnayak. I am an investment advisor at Sprott Asset Management based in San Diego. The following excerpts are from a conversation I recorded with Rick Rule on the 16th of June, 2022. I would encourage all resource investors to pay particular attention to some of the comments that Rick makes in this call when I asked him about the divergence between gold and gold stocks. This may help you with your conviction level through uh, extreme volatility. Rick, I'd like to start this discussion with uh, a few questions in the macro. I, I want to ask you specifically about the credit markets based on what happened yesterday. So we saw a 75 basis point rate hike. This was the first of its kind since 1994. And when I was reading up on it, I was interested to find that Orange County declared bankruptcy when this happened last time around. So the Fed's fund rate is still at 1.6%, and they claim that they are targeting a funds rate of 3% by the end of the year and 3.8% uh, by the end of next year. Now, one of the things that we've discussed many times uh, over the last couple of years is the debt burden. The 10-year yield is already above 3%. And today in the Wall Street Journal, they published the 30-year mortgage rates had hit 5.78%. When I look at what's happening in the stock markets, and I, when I look at all the capital destruction taking place there, it appears to be that the Fed is not particularly concerned about that. So I have two questions for you uh, on, on, on with regards to the credit markets. The first one is, do you think inflation, this unscripted inflation will force the Fed's hands to stay on course, despite the obvious consequences in the credit market? Or do you think that they are just hoping and praying that inflation will come down uh, with such posturing? And the second question is, do you think we are at the end of an era of easy monetary policies? Great questions. Uh, let me begin by saying that I'm supportive of the Fed's action to increase uh, interest rates. Uh, note that with the U.S. 10-year Treasury uh, a little bit above 3%, Savers in the U.S. 10-year Treasury product still enjoy a very substantial negative real yield. Uh, the latest CPI-stated rate of inflation that I have seen is at 8.6%. So an investor in the U.S. 10-year Treasury is still seeing his or her purchasing power destroyed at a compound annual rate that exceeds 5%. While allowing the interest rate to rise from um, below by, by the interest rate, I mean the interest rate of the U.S. 10-year Treasury, to rise from uh, the 1% level, which existed two years ago, to the 3% level that exists today, uh, I think is healthy. But note that over 40 years, the mean return on the U.S. 10-year Treasury has been positive after the CPI stated rate of inflation, which is to say reversion to mean would take the U.S. 10-year rate uh, up above 8.5%. Uh, I do believe that to the extent that the Fed doesn't lose its nerve, that they will be able to bring down the underlying inflation rate, although I don't believe that they'll be able to bring the underlying inflation rate uh, down below, say, 5%. Uh, I think the damage already done to the economy uh, by negative real interest rates, uh, the uh, allowance of price explosion in various sectors, and in particular, the pent-up wage demands are, are such that we have um, built-in inflation in the system that would only be purged out of the system uh, by a recession or, or the type of interest rate explosion that we saw in the Volcker era. era. Uh, my working hypothesis, and it's just that, Aditya, I'm no economist, I'm a credit analyst, but my working hypothesis is that the Fed will continue to raise interest rates as long as they can get away with it. We have seen 
the market's response to increased uh, interest rates, which is to say, we've seen the impact on the long-term bond market. It's been devastated. Uh, and we've seen the impact on the equities markets, uh, which have also been hit very, very, very hard. Uh, understand that increasing interest rates, uh, even increasing negative interest rates, which is to say uh, interest rate increases that are nominal as opposed to real, are very difficult for the broad equities markets. Uh, on the one hand, they raise the cost of capital, particularly debt capital for companies, while at the same time, they lower the capitalized value of distributions, which is to say dividends relative to other savings instruments. So to the extent that the Fed is able to continue uh, the course of allowing interest rates to rise, while simultaneously uh, resisting the urge uh, to counterfeit, which is what I call quantitative easing, uh, I think you'll continue to see soft, uh, at best, soft debt and equity markets. What will, uh, I think, begin to bite is uh, the impact of higher rates uh, on general economic activity. Uh, think about consumer debts uh, as the consumer interest rates around things like consumer durables, uh, appliances and cars, as an example, sold on time. Uh, think about the impact on housing starts and housing uh, affordability with a 200 basis point increase in the U.S. 30-year treasury. Those are important circumstances. Think, too, uh, about the impact of weaker, in particular, bond prices, but also equity prices, on the actuarial assumptions around institutional rates of return, which they're falling very short on. Then they have to increase the current level of contributions, um, which, as we have seen in the last 30 years, uh, they have often been very loath to do. And think finally about the impact of higher interest rates on federal, state, and local governments, uh, which uh, I, I think will be very important uh, to consider. The ability of major metropolitan areas, including, of course, San Diego, uh, given the challenge that they've had over, over time with their underperforming and overpromising pension fund, the idea that San Diego had a difficult time coping with the interest payments, interest levels that existed two years ago, uh, much less the interest level that they're going to have to deal with now. And if you think about taking uh, a San Diego problem and uh, looking at it nationally, uh, federal, state, and local, thinking about the impact of higher interest rates uh, on uh, government budgets uh, means that we are in for, at the very least, interesting times. My working hypothesis is, as I say, that the Fed will continue to raise interest rates until uh, the popular and political outcry is uh, large enough that, like in 1975, they have to reverse course. Uh, I, I would love it if they didn't reverse course. I would love it if I were wrong. I would love it if we had a free market and interest rates and we took on a short, hard recession that was a reset in many regards. But I don't think that most people uh, agree with me. Uh, and I don't think probably any uh, elected politician has the courage to agree with me. I see your point, but governments have a serious problem now, which they haven't had for a long time which is people are seeing, on the one hand, they're seeing prices of everything go up. And on the other hand, they're seeing their wealth go down. A lot of people are starting to question whether monetary policy has something to do with this, even though Powell and Yellen are arguing that it has nothing to do with it. Uh, I think that people have noticed inflation, Aditya, but I don't think that inflation has been with us long enough that people are really truly afraid of it yet. When people see the increase in the price at the pump, uh, some of them may believe that uh, this pump price uh, is a function more of the war in the Ukraine 
then it is a function of years of anti-energy policy uh, in Washington. They don't see it as inflation necessarily. They see it as a one-off at the pump. When people experience inflation in a variety of goods and services over a longer period of time, the response that you'll see among voters and savers begins to be more uh, extreme. Uh, But I don't think you've seen that yet. I remember the decade of the 70s, uh, watching the signs of inflation build up really beginning in 1968. And there was no discernible difference in investor or saver or voter behavior until 1972 or 1973. The Fed's hand was not forced to fight inflation until 1975. And if my memory serves me correctly, the Fed tightening, the increase in the interest rate uh, that we saw in 1975 lasted precisely nine months before the Fed lost its nerve. Uh, As I say, I'm not an economist, so I'm going to go on the assumption that past is prologue, uh, which is to say there will be no popular uh, reaction to inflation until people have experienced it for two or three years, until people come to understand that a 3% pay increase is a 5% pay decrease in real terms. Uh, until their experience paying more for gas at the pump becomes manifested in the fact that they can't afford to buy a new car, until they see the impact of inflation, in fact, stagflation on their ability to retire on their pension or on their pension plan's own solvency, and until they experience for three or four years the decline in purchasing power uh, that they have in terms of their accumulated portfolio and savings. That's how long it took in the 1970s. And I'd be surprised if a popular response to inflation happened any quicker this time. Okay, I'd I'd like to move on and talk about gold. I I don't know whether this has to do with my genetic makeup, (laughs) but I cannot intellectually and objectively, I cannot imagine uh, a better setup for the monetary metals today, given all of the things that we've just talked about. Uh, gold has arguably held up in the face of a lot of capital destruction that we've seen over the last six months. Gold equities certainly have not. And the divergence in performance uh, ha- has been a real important reminder of the difference between an asset class which offers insurance and one that offers leverage. Um, I, I want to ask you this question uh, in the spirit of how you maintain your conviction levels as a contrarian investor over an extended period of time. Uh, with all of the facts and narratives aligning with those that you believed would materialize, but the results being very different. One of the things I still don't see is a lot of generalist money in in the space. And so I have two questions for you again here. One is, does the divergence between the performance of gold and gold equities surprise you uh, in any way? And the second question is, do you have any specific catalysts in mind that would drive a move of generalist money into the gold equities or do you stay away from questions of this nature when you're staying the course in, in your own uh, investments in the precious metal space? Let's talk about the divergence between the gold price and the gold equities price. There are several reasons for this. The first is that gold stocks are stocks, uh, first and foremost. And to the extent that the stock market sells off, all stocks fall off. I remember thinking uh, in the 19th, 19- 1986 crash, 1987 crash, I'm sorry. I remember thinking that a crash uh, was inevitable and probably imminent. And I believe that the consequence of that crash would be quantitative easing, which would be good for gold. I was ultimately right. But when the stock market crashed uh, October 19th, uh, 1987, the gold stocks held up for precisely 24 hours, which is to say one day. Gold stocks were stocks, partly because the sell decision wasn't always made by the investor, but rather by the margin clerk. Uh, And the margin clerk sold anything that had a bid. 
But I think it's important to note that gold stocks are stocks. I think there's a second factor too, uh, which is to say in that wonderful gold bull market that we experienced in the year 2000 to 2011, where the gold price increased from $256 an ounce, if my memory serves me correctly, to over $1,900 an ounce. Uh, what is that, a six, seven-fold increase in the gold price? The gold mining industry conspired to be poorly enough run that uh, free cash flow per share over that period of time from gold mining operations declined. Uh, it took real skill for the industry to destroy as much capital in a bull market as the gold mining industry destroyed in the 2000 to 2011 timeframe. And I think that that uh, experience soured many generalist investors on gold mining as a business. That gold mining companies engaged in disastrous merger and acquisition activities. They made disastrous capital expenditure decisions. The wages, salaries, and emoluments of officers and directors of gold mining companies increased at a more rapid rate than the gold price, and the gold price exploded upwards. I do believe that with regards to the gold equities, at present, we're in a different environment, which is to say most of the people who ran the gold industry in the 2000 to 2011 timeframe for their sins were allowed to pursue other employment opportunities. Uh, and the newer generation of investors, I, uh, pardon me, of managers, I think is very chastened by the incredibly poor corporate performance that their predecessors exhibited during that period of time. Two, the institutional investors are much more gun shy this time around than they were last time around. Last time around, the mantra was growth gold. Uh, the idea was that fiscal discipline was much less important than leverage of the gold price. Uh, I think that the institutional investor now and the high net worth retail investor, that uh, those few <laughs> retail gold bugs like myself who now exist, are a much more prudent lot uh, and much less uh, likely to allow officers and directors to be as extravagantly stupid uh, as we allowed them to be in the last decade. You are seeing now, Aditya, um, divergence between price and value, which I've never seen in the gold mining industry before, uh, which is to say the ratio of uh, enterprise value, market capitalization plus net debt to uh, net present value is the best I've ever seen. Uh, and when I calculate net present value, I can do it at 1800. I don't need to make some fanciful price assumptions. You are seeing too, uh, in a whole range of producers, uh, free cash generation. And I mean, truly free cash generation. I mean, the ability to generate cash, which can be distributed to shareholders, either by way of dividends or buybacks, after budgeting for uh, enough sustaining capital investment at their existing projects and on their pipeline that they're able to maintain production. Uh, this relationship between price and value, if you are using the current precious metals price and or the futures strip uh, on precious metals pricing, which is functionally flat, uh, suggests to me that uh, gold companies, precious metals mining companies, pardon me, uh, are at the most attractive economic levels that I've ever seen them in my career. The second question, I guess, involved around, uh, involves around the gold mining catalyst. I regard gold personally almost as an insurance policy, and I'm in the odd place of owning a fair bit of it and hoping it doesn't go up too much in price uh, because the set of circumstances which would make it go up in price could be very hard on other parts of my portfolio and, frankly, hard on my sense of well-being outside of finance. Um, but I do think the gold market is going higher. And I think the only catalyst that's really required is time. Uh, again, uh, I point back to uh, other periods of U.S. dollar weakness, uh, which is to say 1968, 1969, 1970, 1971, 1972. Uh, it really took five years uh, of uh, economic turbulence. Um, 
for gold to uh, assume a, a relevant place in investors' minds. Similarly, uh, in the 2000 to 2011 uh, bull market, really all of the indicators were in place in 1998 and 1999. We got a glimmer of hope in 2000, but it wasn't until the end of 2022, uh, pardon me, 2002, that both the metal and the equities really began to take off, which is to say the warning signs had to be in place for fully three years before the market paid any attention to the warning signs. We've talked before about why that's true, Aditya. Uh, most investors, most humans, believe themselves to be rational fact seekers. We believe that we search the world for available data, sort that data dispassionately, and act on it, which is, of course, not true. Uh, we are bias confirmation machines, which is to say that we scan the world for data that makes us feel comfortable with our paradigms, uh, our predictions, and our prejudices. Uh, and two, we suffer uh, from what uh, von Mises called recency bias, which is to say our experience in the immediate past is, pays a, a disproportionate, has a disproportionate impact on our expectations of the future. So when people are looking at history, if they're looking at the lessons that they learned in the early part of the decade of the 70s, or the early part of the decade from 2000 to 2010, those lessons are of much lesser importance psychologically than what, have ex what people have experienced over the last year or two years or three years. Uh, we have been through really as a generation, despite some challenges, the mo most benign economic and political climate that the world has ever seen in the period 1980 to 2020. And the expectation has been that almost no matter what goes wrong, the big thinkers in the world, uh, you know, the Fed, academia, Congress, uh, will have people's backs uh, that you buy the dip. Uh, whatever the narrative is uh, at the time, uh, that narrative is very much, I would suggest, still pro-dollar and anti-gold. My suspicion is that in the very near term, uh, like the next month or two or three, that the higher interest rates that the Fed has put in place will hold, uh, that uh, the dollar will do uh, pretty well in relative terms, which is to say relative to other savings instruments, including gold uh, and foreign currency. Uh, and I think, too, that in the very near term, the equity markets are oversold. So it's not unlikely that there could be a reflexive dead cat bounce in equities markets despite higher interest rates. If that's true, we're in for, in the very near term, a rocky road with regards to gold. But that's not why I own gold. Uh, I don't own gold to outpace the Dow in the three-month time frame. Um, I own gold to preserve my purchasing power in the five-year time frame. I don't own gold stocks because I have any expectation that I'm going to see a 20% return before the next long weekend. I own them because I think that they are historically underpriced relative to the metal, which I also think is underpriced. And I own them with the view to the realization of those suspicions will occur in two years, three years, four years, or five years. I want to come back to the question of price. Gold miners produce gold between $1,200 and $1,400 an ounce. Uh, gold is sitting at $1,800 an ounce. So there is no reason for the gold price to go up from, at least from the perspective of the industry continuing to produce more gold if there is a demand for more gold. Do you view the incentive price question in gold in the gold sector differently uh, given its role as a monetary metal? The answer to that in terms of precious metals, uh, including both gold and silver, is yes, I do view them differently. Uh, with gold in particular, we do a very strange thing. We take it from a hole in the ground called a mine and we put it in a hole in the ground called a vault. So on the supply side, most of the supply that's ever existed still exists. 
as finished inventory available to say available for sale so that when one looks at the economics around gold in particular uh, silver less so because of its industrial applications uh, one needs to worry less about the incentive uh, price of production simply because uh, the inventory never goes away it changes hands i would note too aditya and i don't know if you remember this discussion but my experience has been when uh, extractive industry margins on an operating basis industry-wide exceed 50 percent uh, that's normally the part in time the, the point in time depending on capital markets conditions and the overall cost of capital that you begin to see production increases so as an example uh, if the fully loaded industry cost to produce oil around the world was at $60 a barrel and oil was selling at $120 a barrel, assuming that cap capital markets uh, were not destroyed, one would begin to see uh, fairly consistent increases in production as a consequence of the recycling of that cash flow uh, and also as a confidence of investment, investor and management confidence in the sector. A circumstance where uh, the all-in sustaining cost of gold is between $1,200 and $1,400 an ounce, uh, without amortizing back into that, A, the cost of capital, but much more particularly uh, the capital destruction from prior year write-downs, means that you wouldn't expect, from my point of view, to see profound increases in supply until the gold price went through twenty eight, twenty nine hundred, or three thousand uh, dollars. I think it would take much larger uh, operating margins, and it would take operating margins that had to take into account the capital destruction that had occurred over prior terms. So the price manipulation question is not something that uh, you spend a lot of time thinking about. I don't. I believe that all financial markets are manipulated. I cut my teeth in Vancouver on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Uh, uh, and that was get, like getting a postdoctoral uh, education in manipulation. But in my experience, manipulation uh, at its core is fairly short term because manipulation involves a conspiracy. And in my experience, uh, conspirators uh, are neither over time particularly competent or particularly loyal to each other. Uh, I think, too, that manipulation takes place in the fashion that's the easiest to achieve, which is to say that when the market for gold is weak, it's easy to manipulate the gold market down. There were manipulations in the precious metal markets in the 1970s, short-term manipulations in precious metals, uh, that were manipulations to the upside, short squeezes and things like that, simply because the sentiment made manipulation in that fashion the easiest. I'm not trying to say that precious metals and precious metal equities markets aren't manipulated all the time. They are. Uh, in the short term, imagine a market as an example, like the silver market, where on any given day, a uh, hundred times uh, the silver available for delivery uh, trades uh, in the futures market. Uh, a circumstance where someone builds a fairly large short position uh, over a two year uh, futures ladder, uh, and then borrows physical silver and sells it into the silver market overnight uh, when the market is at its thinnest in order to cause havoc in the spot market, which in turn would cause havoc in the more leveraged futures market, uh, is a very easy transaction to affect. It's tougher not to get caught at it but it's a fairly easy uh, transaction to affect. Uh, a, a billion dollar short position, as an example, can probably be put in place for 100 to $120 million in margin. Uh, and then borrowing 50 million, ounce, $50 million worth, pardon me, of physical silver 
against sufficient collateral to dump in the overnight market could easily, easily cause the spot silver market to decline by four or five percent uh, and cause the futures market to decline by seven or eight percent. A seven or eight percent move in a billion or a billion and a half dollar short position uh, certainly is attractive relative to the costs involved in causing all that to occur. And I think that happens continually. I don't think that we have seen, uh, uh, which many people allege, uh, a decades-long conspiracy to depress the price of precious metals. I'd like to close out this call with a question about the, the Resource Investing Conference next month. In our last conversation, we talked about thinking about the macro, but investing based on the micro. Uh, You are going to be hosting a conference next month where I think that that conference embodies that particular theme where you have some very interesting macro thinkers and and you have a lot of companies as well. One of the questions I, I would have for you is what is the main thing that you would like somebody who attended it last year to get out of this year's conference? Well, I I suspect uh, that this year's conference will make attendees a lot of money. Uh, And I suspect that for a few reasons, but mostly because markets are in disarray and there's real value. And many people are afraid. The lessons that we taught last year were good lessons, Uh, but it was an online conference. Uh, it would have been easier for me, DT to make this year's conference a virtual conference, much easier. Uh, I could have done it from Anacortes, Washington, as opposed to going to Boca Raton, Florida. But there's a lot that's missing uh, in a purely virtual conference. There's a whole bunch of communication that's nonverbal. Uh, I remember personally myself four years ago at the Vancouver conference Uh, following at a discrete distance, uh, both Robert Friedland uh, and then later Ross Beatty uh, and finally Sean Rosen, uh, three of the living legends that have built multi-billion dollar companies. I remember following them through the exhibit hall, uh, watching who they were talking to, watching which exhibitors elicited their interest, watching who made them smile, watching who made them frown. (laughs) <laughs> and then later, uh, availing myself of the opportunity to listen to these living legends uh, interview exhibitors uh, about their business. Because learning how to invest, uh, having the courage to write a check, having the discipline not to write a check, uh, is really what the investment and the speculative process is about. Uh, and there's just absolutely no better venue to do it than surrounded by four or 500 other people that care enough about their investment outcomes to take four days and several hundred dollars uh, to invest in their education. Uh, Having the ability to visit with one of these gurus uh, one-on-one in, as an example, the Harbor Cruise uh, or at the coffee machine or at breakfast. Uh, having the ability to watch uh, exhibitors uh, talk among themselves uh, about the markets. Uh, I think all that's invaluable. If you're planning to attend this event uh, and would like to spend some time in person uh, talking through your portfolio or any other questions you may have, including optimizing your time at this conference, I would be happy to spend some time with you in person uh, in Florida. Please email me in advance uh, and we can uh, set a time up accordingly.